Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask an Addiction Specialist. I'm Bob Weathers. I'm Odie Martinez. And we're happy to be with, uh, with, with you again this week. Thanks for joining us. Uh, last week, I introduced myself uh, by my background, and I'll do that again today. Uh, I'm a professor of clinical psychology here locally at California Southern University. I work with a, a number of doctoral students who are doing their dissertations uh, in areas related to addiction recovery. So it's uh, really a pleasure to work with them. And secondly, I'm, I'm a recovery coach, which as any of you who've watched our previous uh, videos know, I come right from beginnings treatment centers right before each week's meeting here. Mm -hmm. uh, as I did today, we had about 20 young men, mostly young men in early recovery from addiction. And I love that group. And so I, I do, I, I run psychoeducational groups at beginnings as well as do uh, recovery coaching here locally uh, in a private practice office. I want to mention something today as context. Uh, my co-producers, Austin Armstrong and Franz Salvatierra, as well as Odie Martinez are aware of this. A dear friend of mine, an older man that I meet with every week uh, for, uh, we have a 12-step meeting on Saturdays. I just found out last night that he's been hospitalized uh, uh, and it's a serious uh, medical condition. And I'm aware that uh, I carry that with me today. And I think mm -hmm. rather than trying to hide that, uh, I'd rather just name that. So if you've, if you've been with us, Odie and me, you'll, you might notice the difference in my energy level, um, uh, my emotional expressiveness and so on. And I think I'm in a sadder place today. And I certainly will say this, I'm in more of a sleep deprived place today. As it is, I woke up in the middle of the night with Logan very much on my heart. And so didn't get quite as much sleep as I needed. So I hope that you can bear with that. And if I can just name that up front, then we can move on with the material. I care deeply about this material and I'm hoping my body will be here <laughs> to support the material. I wanna mention something while I'm thinking of it. Over my years of uh, working as a psychologist and, and doing psychotherapy and in more recent times operating as a recovery coach where I'm working with individuals for the most part who are either in recovery from addiction or with their family members, is that I'll oftentimes uh, preface a session, if there's something out of the ordinary, I'll preface it like I just did. Mm. I'll just say, um, I'm a little bit off today, and sometimes it's because I have a bit of a cold or something, I'll just name that, so that they're not left guessing what's going on. Mm. And I guess the importance for me, including mentioning that to you, to you all today in our audience, is that you can feel it in the field between us and so rather than being left to guessing and trying to figure out if it's something about you <laughs> it's not it's about me and it may impact you slightly i hope it doesn't impact you greatly but it's just about trying to be transparent about that so it feels better just to share that Absolutely. rather than trying to fake it yeah. does that make sense yeah very well said because mm. uh you know for those of you out there that are married uh mm. you know you get mm. home from somewhere and uh, either your wife or maybe even your husband, you know, they have their arms crossed, they're just kind of looking at you, kind of got to guess, okay, yeah, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah. This isn't, yeah. this is weird, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll be talking about communicating specific, specifically love later in today's presentation. And communications theorists say that 90% of our communication mm. is nonverbal. It's, right. it's the arms crossed. Yeah. It's all the other things. And so only 10% are the words that we say. The other 90%, you can feel it, but it's oftentimes hard to put your finger on it because it's mm. not verbal and yeah. it's um, subtler. So uh, in, the honor, in honoring full communication, we try to be transparent here today. So thank you for joining us. Let me invite you to um, uh, submit questions as we move forward today through this topic. And uh, also, I want you to invite friends to join us. You're welcome to reach out to friends today or during the week. We have we archive uh, today's presentation. We archive these videos at a few different locations. You can find them on YouTube under Ask an Addiction Specialist. You can also find them under Beginnings Treatment Centers uh, under the podcasts uh, uh, under the category of Ask an Addiction Specialist, mm -hmm. as well as many of you have entered into today's podcast through the Facebook group, Ask an Addiction Specialist. So there are multiple roads to Rome. Rome. They all lead there. And, uh, and we're glad that you're here with us today. Love for you to interact. Odie and I love to respond to your questions in real time. And I'll, when we wrap up today, I'll also give you some ways that you can write to me directly with questions that you may have that come to you later. I tend to be a slow processor sometimes. And so in a classroom situation, for example, 
There's somebody on the phone right there. They want to talk to us right now. That's great. Thank you for calling. <laughs> um, uh, sometimes I'll have a delayed reaction. So after a class is over, or even after an interaction is mm -hmm. over, I'll think of, this is what I wanted to say to Odie. And if you're like that at all, well, we want to allow for you to have as delayed a reaction as you have and then feel like that you can reach out to us. So you can reach out to mm -hmm. us through Facebook, YouTube, uh, and I'll give you my uh, uh, website address uh, at the very tail end. You can write me there too. Last week, our topic was practice makes perfect. Mm. And we focused on how it is that recovery uh, from addiction is served by, by practicing new skills and developing those to, to where they become habitual. We talked, of, we talked about the German phrase that translates into practice makes the master. How can we be a master of our emotions, so to speak, including being able to make sense of them and be with them even when they sometimes get the better of us to yeah. find some kind of perspective on it and that it takes practice. Today's topic has an odd title, but I will flesh it out, I promise you. Today's topic is Surprise Shame with Love. Mm -hmm. We've been talking in this series about shame and specifically how to reduce shame in our lives, what I call unshaming. And today we're going to talk about the relationship of shame, uh, and I'll define shame in just a few moments, the relationship of shame to loving relationship. Mm. And I'm going to save the, uh, the piece de resistance, where I'm going to talk <laughs> about surprise at the very end of our, of our presentation. So hang on for that, you all. I want to start off by talking about shame. Uh, as an interpersonal phenomenon. We, we've done work here and we're going to be doing work even next week where we work on self-forgiveness mm -hmm. as an internal practice. You can practice that alone. I can mm -hmm. practice self-forgiveness alone and we'll be doing a mindfulness meditation next week uh, in an advanced way of being able to go into self-compassion or self-forgiveness by ourselves. But shame itself as an emotion is profoundly interpersonal and so I want to speak about that for just a moment. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody likes your shirt, Odie. <laughs> it's flamingos. A, it's a great shirt. It's a great shirt. Thank you. Shame is interpersonal. What do we mean by that? I think it helps to start by just defining shame the way we've talked about the two faces of shame. Shame is, on the one hand, it's a threat to social acceptance. Mm -hmm. That puts it right in the social sphere. That is, is that it's interpersonal. If I fear that you're going to reject me, then whatever feelings are stirred up are directly a function of our interpersonal relationship. Right. And shame is that. Shame is a threat to Odie's accepting me or me accepting Odie. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that, we talk about the two faces of shame. The flip side of that is that we'll go into our self-esteem is that if I feel like I'm going to be rejected by somebody or have, in fact, experienced reject rejection, mm -hmm. it's hard for me not to reject myself or mm -hmm. judge myself. And so kind of two sides of a coin. So in this sense, uh, we talk about shame as being one of the emotions that's radically interpersonal. We talk about shame in terms of its... Uh, we had one presentation we talked about, call it the black hole of shame, the pain of shame deep in our bodies. And we've talked about where shame locates. Yeah. For some people, it's in their chest, in their heart, or in their, in their stomach, their gut. Or people get tense around their shoulders or break out in a sweat or turn red. It, it manifests uh, in all kinds of different ways physically. It's definitely one of the most unpleasant emotions. In fact, we made this point. Uh, recently, is that of all the emotions that humans experience, shame is associated with the highest elevation of stress hormones, specifically cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so of all the various uh, emotions that stir up our, our fight or flight reaction, right. shame is actually the most extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, this came from a, a meta-analysis of 200 studies that looked at what kicks up the highest levels of stress hormones. Well, it turns out that, that threats to social acceptance, threats to so self-esteem, those are the ones that are most stressful. So if shame is interpersonal and that unpleasant, we want to look at the flip side of that is, what about the healing of shame? Well, doesn't it make sense that at least some part of the healing of shame itself has to be interpersonal. Mm -hmm. I can do a lot of work on myself, and you can do a lot of work on yourself, Odie. Yeah. But if we don't have relationships in which to really build a, a foundation of healing, mm -hmm. then shame really won't be healed because it is very tied into the interpersonal domain. So today we're going to talk about what psychology refers to as a corrective emotional experience. If you're familiar with that term, no. You're not, okay? <laughs> so let's break it down. We've, we've already established that shame is an emotional experience. In fact, it's a very aversive or negative, unpleasant 
uh, uh, experience, mm -hmm. but what would it be to be able to correct that? And the, hence mm -hmm. the idea of a corrective okay. emotional experience. Can we correct that? I learned the most about a corrective emotional experience from the next uh, individual. This is Dr. Bonnie Badenoch. Bonnie was my supervisor for some years, and uh, mm. we, although we have not worked directly together in the last few years, her influence stays strongly with me. And part of what I want to do today is to take you through what Bonnie taught me about corrective emotional experience. Mm. So by the end of this, it will be crystal clear to you, Odie. Okay? Great. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Me too. During the time in which I worked with Bonnie, she published a book. This is the title of it, Being a Brainwise Therapist. She's published two books since then. And I'll tell you something about my work with, with, with Bonnie is that she's helped me as much as anybody I've worked with to understand what's going on psychologically for us, to understand it in terms of what's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. And Bonnie is a heartfelt person. In fact, I think her website is called Nurturing the Heart with the Body in Mind, mm -hmm. something very close to that. And so she's very, she's very much of a heart nurturer, uh, nurturing the heart with the brain in mind. That's it, nurturing oh. the heart with the brain in mind, <laughs> is that she holds the brain as being kind of the locus of our consciousness and of our emotions, but does so in a very heartfelt way. So it's not, um, it's not all just technical left brain mm -hmm. conversation with Bonnie for sure. So I learned a great deal from Bonnie about uh, the function of the brain. I've applied that directly to my work in, in working with individuals in recovery from addiction because I do talk a lot about the effect of, of addiction on the brain mm -hmm. as well as what happens to the brain in early recovery. Right. And so I learned a lot of this from Bonnie early on. In fact, I interviewed Bonnie, the next slide, I interviewed Bonnie as part of, uh, of a master lecture is what it was called at my university, California Southern University. And here's a picture of us together. This is a few years ago where she was kind enough to come down from where she lives in uh, Vancouver, uh, Washington, came down and presented here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look up Dr. Bon Bonnie Badenoch and look up YouTube videos, this video will come up number one because it's been viewed by a lot of people <laughs> where Bonnie talks about her concepts in a very, um, very accessible way. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned from Bonnie, in addition to understanding about the brain, is I learned a lot about mindfulness. Bonnie's deeply committed to mindfulness meditation practice, as I have been, and it's been, she was extremely helpful to me in being able to kind of modify my own practice in a way that would match my personality. So I, I give blessings to Bonnie for that work, for sure and also for her use of metaphors. And today we're going to talk for the next few minutes about a railway metaphor. And specifically, it's the, the coupling between two railroad cars. Mm -hmm. And so this is Bonnie's railway coupling metaphor. And we're going to talk about this in terms of how it is that we heal from shame and more broadly from trauma, how we heal psychologically and we'll talk about it in terms of the brain, but we're going to actually use railroad cars to talk about the brain. Sounds good. Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. So the next slide. What happens in psychological trauma? One of the things that's guaranteed to happen in psychological trauma is that those that we would seek intimacy with, that we would mm. seek closeness with, they become associated with danger. Mm. And there's all kinds of forms of that. There's abuses mm -hmm. that, will, that will violate the sacred trust that intimacy requires. There are abandonments. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and one of the traumas that we've talked a lot about in the last weeks here that relates a lot to the clients I work with and my own, my own work with myself in recovery is shame. And so we come to somebody with the hope of, of a trusting, safe response, mm -hmm. and instead we're shamed. Mm. We can be criticized. We can, be, we can be severely punished, we can be ignored. There's lots of ways mm -hmm. that that will translate for the one who's on the receiving end, especially a child, will translate into, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Since you don't love me, there must be something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Very few children, especially early on, can assume that there's something wrong with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. They have to assume it's wrong with them. Uh, that realization may come later that there's maybe something wrong with mom and dad, but typically by the time that comes, the child has already internalized a message that somehow or another, I'm not worthy of love. Mm. I'm worth being abused. I'm worth being neglected. Mm. So if we think of then that in the context of trauma, in this intimacy comes to equal danger, then let's come back to our railway metaphor. Here's a picture of a, a, a two railroad cars 
And if you can spot right between them, that metal piece there, I'm going to show you a close-up in just a second, that metal piece where these two, these two railroad cars join is called a coupling. Mm. I actually did more research this week on railway couplings than probably most people in this room. <laughs> <laughs> so if we look at two railroad cars and then tie it back to what I just shared, I'm going to share once again, trauma leaves us with the sense of intimacy as one car, the other car is danger, and they couple together where they're inseparable. Mm. And you'll notice in this slide here, I have an asterisk, that one of the dangers that we spend a lot of time talking about, shame, is that intimacy brings up for me a feeling of shame if I've, been, if I've experienced trauma, yeah. and it's almost automatic. Let me ask you, Odie. Yeah, sounds good. What, what uh, in a state of shame, how does that show up in intimate relationship? If, if, if intimacy equals shame, let's say, mm -hmm. intimacy equals danger, and in this case, shame, how might I or you respond to an intimate relationship with someone else, a conversation, someone that we care about, when shame is in the, in the front yard? Any mm -hmm. thoughts about that? Well, I, I would have to say uh, retreating is probably the first thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, even if uh, let's just say for an example, there's uh, a relationship and there was um, some mistrust there, you know, somebody cheated, you know, and but they still decided to stay together, yep. you know. Yep. And um, when the intimacy part of it comes into play for both of yeah. them, yeah. Uh, retreating yeah. will come once yeah. they're trying to yes. be intimate and not necessarily... Uh, sexually, but even just something as simple as I love you, you mm -hmm. know, could be um, retreated. Yes. You know, you, yeah. you hesitate to, to say it. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, to say it yeah. uh, back or even just to say it in general. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I just met with someone last night in coaching, and this was the topic that we were talking about, and it was exactly the dynamic you're talking oh, wow. about. In the context <laughs> of a perceived infidelity mm -hmm. that, that this individual's partner retreats, moves away. Mm. So one response is to retreat, another is to attack. Uh, this individual's partner also yeah. attacks. And as we've talked about before, shame may manifest as fight. Mm -hmm. As a defense against shame, I'll just fight you, I'll attack you. Right. Another defense is that I'll move away, I'll yeah. flee. And a third, a third response that's tied into this fight flight response is a freeze response. And shame oftentimes will just be where we're like a deer in the headlights, we're just right. paralyzed. Mm -hmm. And so in any case, in all three of those cases, it radically affects intimacy in terms of our being able to do the one thing that intimacy requires, which is to open our hearts, mm -hmm. to be vulnerable. Yeah. Shame will not, will not encourage us doing that. Mm -hmm. So in the next slide, we have another example. This is a close-up, I promised you, of two railroad cars. This is the metal coupling. You can imagine then what you get in this, what you get in this image is how inseparable uh, uh, intimacy, in this case shame, can be linked is that there's no intimacy without shame and they're just locked in there uh, yeah. like, like metal couplings that aren't going to be pulled apart. So I want to ask everyone a question, including Odie and Bob. What happens if I risk intimacy, but in a different context? Now, I want to shift the context. Now we're not talking about a trauma-based con context. We're talking mm -hmm. about a safe situation. So what happens if I come to a safe situation, but I have a history of intimacy equaling danger, and I really work hard, I work up the gumption to make myself vulnerable, to open myself up? What's What's possible to happen there? And I want to talk us through that mm -hmm. using this railway coupling metaphor that I got from Bonnie Badenoch in our supervision. So the question is, in safety, what happens if I risk intimacy? The quick answer would be, why would I do that? Because most often yeah. we won't. But what I'm asking is, what happens if we actually do work up the courage to risk intimacy? So the next image uh, is of a railway coupling. And there it is right there. What happens if I risk intimacy? In other words, if I risk pulling apart, acting as if intimacy does not equal danger. So I pull right. those two apart from one another, just temporarily. In other words, in safety, 
intimacy, at least for this moment, does not equal danger. So mm -hmm. I'm breaking the coupling between intimacy and danger. Mm -hmm. I'm risking being vulnerable with you. And I've set this up because now Odia is safe. And so I can risk doing that. Everything in my being says, don't do that, Bob, don't do that. Mm -hmm. But if I risk that, if I pull them apart, then there's the possibility of a different kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. And in the context of shame is the possibility of having an unshaming interaction. Yeah. That is to say that you're not going to shame me. You're not going to invade me or abandon me. Mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm willing to risk that, we pull apart the coupling. Then what happens when, when the, the coupling comes back together? That's the next image. When the coupling comes back together, they pull the part, they come back together. Actually, this is what happens in the brain. And this is very interesting material that's being done right now mm -hmm. in research on uh, research animals as well as with human beings. You can't really do research on human beings' brains, but we're looking at this as, as much as we can through uh, brain scans, mm -hmm. is that when, the, when the, the brain recouples after an experience of safety where intimacy mm -hmm. actually does not represent danger. When the brain recouples, it actually recouples with a new principle, which is to say that intimacy in the context of safety actually leads to a good thing. The next slide suggests that my risking intimacy with you opens up my experience of your compassion. Mm. Okay. And so in place of what used to be danger is now compassion. In the place of what used to be shame is unshaming. And that the brain at a neural level actually uncouples from the old organizing principle, mm -hmm. intimacy equals danger, to a new organization of intimacy equals compassion. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Sort of. Okay. okay. I'm still trying to grasp the concept of, um, of that. Because, okay, so it's shame, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When it's... This is the old, this is the, the old way it's organized. Shame. And, you, and, and shame would you, say, don't ever open yourself up. But let's but say that you, you do open, open yourself up. up. And then it... You, well, you, it makes a big difference if what you get is safety. And if what you have is safety and the coupling comes back together, uh -huh. you had a new experience that now must be integrated and it's not the old experience. Right. And the cool thing about the way the body and the brain remember mm -hmm. is you've actually formed a new memory, a new association. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. The old association was there ironclad. You opened yourself up. You literally opened your heart. Mm -hmm. And after that experience, it has to happen when you're, mm -hmm. it has to happen when you're really activated by fear. Oh, <laughs> you have to okay. be really courageous. I'm going to risk doing something that my body and being say don't do. Okay. I risk that and the healing comes in. Then when the when the brain reconsolidates, when it mm -hmm. reconnects like that, it reconnects with this new experience. That's what's getting remembered. Mm, okay. Uh, let me say this. So I, I want to use another example. So mm -hmm. let's say that somebody that's fearful of uh, public speak speaking, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they tried it once and no, you know, it failed miserably. So they connected that with yes, danger. Per perfect right? example. And yeah. then yeah. they tried again, but this time it went better. Yes. So that it, Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Got you got you very got you got the right idea. You remind me, my first year in graduate school, all those years ago, I volunteered to be a subject in a student's dissertation, and his dissertation was on public speaking anxiety, mm. and was, and I was very nervous about this, and I I didn't realize how much I was going to need that because I've taught for my living, I yeah. my entire living, I've been in front of people, including right now. <laughs> And so I'm very grateful to Dr. Wayne Aoki for having me be a subject in his experiment. And we started off by creating a baseline. And the fact was, is that I was very nervous about speaking in, in public. And we had, a, it's been all these years ago. I don't remember the details of it other than I had an unpleasant experience with it. And he helped us develop skills. And this is the intervention. He helped mm -hmm. us develop skills to be able to um, modify uh, our anxiety by being able to relax mm -hmm. was one of the things. Mm -hmm. And so as we develop skills to do that, then he'd have us do what you just talked about right. and speak again. And lo and behold, we'd be less anxious, have more of a successful experience, less anxiety arousing, and, and the success built upon the success. And so mm -hmm. I got more and more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Enough so, we have a question, I'll come to that in just a second. Enough so that when I spoke before the American Pharmacists Association a little over a month ago, right as I was getting ready to go up, Wayne Aoki, you'll appreciate this. Right before <laughs> I went up there, I did some self-regulation uh, uh, in terms of just focusing on my breathing and calming myself. Mm -hmm. So in the 30 seconds or a minute, I was just breathing. Mm 
So mm-hmm. they're announcing me, Dr. Bob Weathers, did, did all this stuff, and I'm focusing on my breath. And so when I got up there, at least it kept me from passing out from an anxiety <laughs> attack. I was nervous because yeah. I was speaking to 400 strangers, and they're all in a profession I've never spoken to before, pharmacists. But I was practicing what Wayne taught me mm-hmm. almost 40 years ago, yeah. which is how to relax ourselves. And once I got going, then the experience was successful enough mm-hmm. that it, my anxiety abated. Okay. So that's a, that's a perfect metaphor for that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We'll okay. come back to another metaphor in just a second. There's a question here. This is a great question, and I'm going to come to it in just a second. This individual said, how about the earliest times in recovery when there's a breaking open at the deepest part of the soul, mm. we talk about this in recovery as when you hit bottom, it's an awful experience of losing everything that you've held on to. And this, in fact, I just met with a group of men right before I came here today, and I asked this question, how many of you have experienced what you understand to be hitting bottom as a part of your addiction and part of what got you here? And every single person, 20 men, all raised their hands. Mm-hmm. And so I do want to come to that. It's a perfect example. That will be my next example. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, before I move to that, let me mention something, and it ties into this example of public speaking. It ties into the example earlier of intimate relationships, is that what we're talking about in terms of this coupling and then an uncoupling, and then a new coupling. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about is that one time is probably not nearly sufficient. Mm. It requires practice, which brings us to last week's presentation. Do you remember the German phrase? We taught you German last week. And the German phrase was, Übung macht den Meister. I have a dear friend who speaks German, and I talked to him this week, and I told him that we had picked that as the title of the presentation, (laughs) and he was particularly pleased. (laughs) What the heck does Übung macht den Meister mean? Well, it translates most literally into English as practice makes the master. And our point here is that this, this... uncoupling and then recoupling with new experiences. It needs to be repeated Mm -hmm. again and again. And so earlier when I talked about corrective emotional experience, Mm -hmm. it's actually best understood as corrective emotional experiences, Mm -hmm. that it's plural. And so whether it's you public speaking or me public speaking, Mm -hmm. whether it's you risking being vulnerable to your wife or me, mine, it requires multiple experiences of that to really consolidate this. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking more specifically about consolidating these experiences a little bit later today. Okay. But I want to move right now to the, the next example spurred by this question. Thank you. The question again is, how about this coupling, uncoupling, and recoupling? How about the earliest times of recovery where, the, where there's a breaking open at the deepest part of our soul? Can we skip the next slide, Franz, and move to the, the following slide? Yeah, that slide. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I'll come back to that other slide in a moment. Remember, this is the image of the uncoupling. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking this week, and it really ties into this this question. I've been thinking this week that that when we when we hit our limits uh, uh, in life, I work a lot with individuals who have hit their limits as a function of addiction. Every week, I work with individuals that have hit bottom in this sense is that there's a momentary breaking apart of the, of the ego, mm-hmm. of my sense of self. Mm-hmm. Who I thought I was has been revealed. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it's associated with embarrassing, uh, uh, shameful uh, revelations. Mm-hmm. I've been found out to be addicted. I've been found out to be uh, making really poor decisions, etc. Mm-hmm. And in that, there's oftentimes a crushing kind of humiliation that comes yeah. with that. That's kind of built into what happens in the course of most uh, uh, addicts uh, moving into recovery and therapy is awareness that I can't do this anymore. I've literally hit the wall and can't go any further. Mm. So in that hitting of the wall, what I'd like to suggest, and I'm going to check with you to see if this makes sense, is that if, if... if, if, if I'm held together with this, this way of operating, including an increasing uh, amount of addictive behaviors, mm-hmm. when I hit the wall, there's a momentary <coughs> like this. Mm-hmm. It breaks apart. Yeah. There's a breaking apart. That's this first image. The next image is this. 
is that in that breaking apart, if I can enter into safe relationships, and I'm going to speak specifically about what happens in self-help support groups, mm -hmm. uh, our audience will be aware of resources like the 12-step support groups, AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, Narcotics Anonymous. We've also mentioned here Refuge Recovery, which is a mindfulness-based approach to recovery. There's also Smart Recovery, which is a scientifically-based approach to recovery. Each one of these offers support for those that are seeking recovery from addiction. And what's in common across all of them is a sense of safety, mm. is that if you talk about your addiction and the awful things that you may have done around your addiction, and I do that, not only are we invited to do that in our group, Odie, you and I are actually expected to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And early on, when this is just broken apart, may be the right time to do that because it might be the time that I'm, my defenses are most down. Mm. I don't have anything to hide from you. I've been found out. Yeah. I've been found out to myself, to those that I love the most. Mm -hmm. And in the context of a safe relationship, in this case, in a self, self-help support group, this wouldn't be the only item. This mm -hmm. could also happen in therapy. It could happen with a minister. It could happen in any context where there's safe containment. Yeah. There's the possibility of this intimacy, my revealing myself to you, as not being shameful. You're not going to mm -hmm. shame me. You're actually going to embrace me with compassion. Yeah. And actually then a chance for me to come back into a new coupling, mm -hmm. like we talked about earlier. In this case, we're talking about hitting bottom, opening up my heart in the context, let's say, of a 12-step support group where, mm -hmm. where I'm expected to share my shadow. Mm -hmm. And I get, I get compassionate response and supportive response in the direction of recovery. So when, it, when I reconsolidate, rather than beating myself <laughs> with the self-judgment that I have or that any of us have mm -hmm. in addiction, I can actually begin to respond with this new organization, which is the compassion you gave me, mm -hmm. I'm now giving me. Mm -hmm. And so I begin to respond with self-compassion. Okay. Now, does that make sense? Let's come up for air here. Yeah, that... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that makes perfect sense. That reminds me of uh, when I first started going to to groups. Um, when I first hit bottom, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess on a kind of an accident, everything that you just said, I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as soon as I hit, I went straight to the groups. Good instinct. Yeah, good and for I you. was able to yeah. to do exactly what you're okay. you're talking about. Okay. Not only was I able to openly share with complete strangers, but yeah. I was able to open up to uh, my then girlfriend and then yeah. now wife. Yes. Uh, so I was able to to heal that part of yeah. of what I was yeah. ashamed of. Yeah. And um, second thing is this reminds me of uh, Bible study yesterday. Mm, good. Uh, some a man, one of the men in the the group, said something really really good that made me think of uh, when I first started groups too. He said mm. that uh, Christ suffered. When Christ suffered, he learned obedience, mm. pretty much to mm. continue to mm -hmm. to do God's will. Yes. And uh, yeah. I thought about that for myself, like, okay, you know, I hit bottom, I, yeah. I suffered, not just me, but, you know, people around me suffered. But through that, I was able to, to learn obedience yeah. you know, and continue yeah. to do that. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You make me think of, if, if you've read uh, in the Gospels, and whether you're a Christian or not, you can get great value out of, of what Odie's talking about, mm -hmm. is that Jesus is depicted on the cross, and he cries out to, to the heavens. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you left me here? That's hitting bottom. From a human perspective, that's hitting bottom. Yeah. I'm completely abandoned here mm -hmm. in, in mortal agony. And 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 then there then there's a shift and he and he says, he says, uh, not my will but thine. Mm -hmm. That's that's a new consolidation. That's mm -hmm. a, there's something new coming there. It's no longer about me. That's gone. Not my will but thine. And then the last words that he's depicted as saying is, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. I give myself to you. And so from a Christian perspective, yeah. it very much mirrors what what you'll learn in the twelve step programs where they yeah. talk about about uh, uh, surrendering to a higher power. Mm -hmm. And it's open there to being Christian or being uh, 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 other religious traditions right. or even being non-religious because it speaks to the human condition. That's the universality of the Christian message. That's yeah. the universality of what we're talking about here is that we get broken open. Why hast thou forsaken me? And then we have the chance of experiencing grace, whether it's from God or from another person mm -hmm. in the group, let's say. Yeah. That coming back together and then we're able to 
surrender ourselves mm. and, with, and, and, and surrender, I want to say surrender our self-separateness yeah. and our self-judgment, surrender mm -hmm. that to compassion. Yeah. It's very powerful transformation. Yeah. Um, it's one of the incredible hidden gifts in the level of suffering that you and I both know, yeah. both being in recovery mm -hmm. from our respective addictive behaviors, is that once having hit bottom and being broken open, it's possible to come back with a changed self. And mm -hmm. I believe that you have this, yeah. and I know I have this, yeah. and I'm assuming you do, as I know I have this because <laughs> it's from the inside. There's no doubt about it. Let me pause here. Thank you, Odie. Let me yeah, pause here. There's, a, there's another question up here. Since you point out that it takes a lot of repetition, do you think we can do this uncoupling, this, with someone we feel safe with by setting it up as a practice? It mm -hmm. seems like there aren't many real-life situations where you can do this uncoupling. That's a very good question. I want to respond by, first of all, re referring to what Odie was talking about. You're talking about a Bible study, mm -hmm. and you also talked about going to a support group where yeah. you can go repetitively and can count on the rules of the game being we're setting up safety here. I think you can do this with an individual. I think it can, it, it can be a, uh, a spiritual mentor. Uh, 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 it can be a, a, a priest or a minister. I think it can be a therapist for sure, mm -hmm. a counselor, a coach. I think uh, uh, I know that especially good friends can do this with one another if there's an agreement that we're going to respond to each other in this kind of holy or sacred way. Mm -hmm. And I really do think that it requires, um, I, as you say here in the question, setting it up as a practice, being conscious about it. I think it takes revisiting this again and again. Also implied in your question, well, stated in your question, there aren't many real life situations where you can do this. I think that's accurate. Mm -hmm. I even thought of it a minute ago when I said, whether it's going to a group, going to a Bible study, going to an individual, even going to a friend, what I thought of is the way that psycho psychology talks about this is that we're talking about an asocial interaction, which mm -hmm. is odd, because the social interaction that we're used to is judgment mm -hmm. or advice. Yeah. Let me tell you what to do, Odie. Here's what you need to do. That's what, that's, that's what we tend to do socially. Yeah. And so it takes setting that aside, almost a special dispensation. Can we agree? Let's say that you do this with a good friend. Can we agree that for this period of time together that we'll respond to each other? You probably wouldn't use the word asocial, but that's what we're talking about. Can we suspend our typical way of responding, whether it's with advice or judgment, and create a sacred safe space here where I respond to you with caring and compassion so that you can receive that? Mm -hmm. And one of my thoughts is that you can do this with good friends and then reverse it is that you can share. That's what happens in groups, yeah. is that you share and somebody administers compassion to you. Mm -hmm. Five minutes later, they share mm -hmm. and you do that with them. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's in a group context or with individuals in our lives, it takes a special individual, somebody who's able to offer this kind of deep level presence, but it's quite possible. Yeah. And it's certainly what I would anticipate would be right at the center or the heart of transformation that goes on in any form of therapy or counseling or coaching. This would be right at the heart of it. It's a good question. It, uh, it requires great skill and I think also great generosity of spirit for, for any of us to, to be offered that in our lives. I've been offered that by dear souls in my life. You have too. And it's healed us. It's yeah. transformed our lives. Absolutely. So what we're talking about, next slide here, is that the healing that we're discussing is, is where intimacy gets uncoupled from danger mm -hmm. and recoupled with compassion. Hmm. And compassion is the opposite of shame as we've talked about it. So we're talking about intimacy becomes coupled with safety, with compassion, with unshaming. Mm. Last week I gave you a German lesson, Übung Machstein Meister, this week, I'm going to give you a Latin lesson. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I told you the title for today early on is Surprise, Shame with Love. I want to share with you something that another dear friend of mine, who's actually a spiritual mentor of mine, shared with me some years ago. He had heard this at a conference by a very esteemed psychologist, and I'm very touched to pass this along to you. And he talked about the word surprise. We may have talked about it here, but we've never talked about it in this context. The, the origin of the word surprise, the etymology of the word surprise comes from the Latin, 
and it's and the word surprise is broken into sur and prize. And if you look at the the prefix of sur, sur means above. For example, to surmount is to climb above. So sur means above. Prize is more complicated. Prize comes from the Latin root of the word that we would use as prehension. Comprehension, apprehension. How I think about it is prehension is connected to the idea of a prehensile tail. What is a prehensile tail, you ask? If you've ever been to a zoo and watched monkeys, monkeys have prehensile tails. What do those tails do? Those tails are able to grab a hold of branches while they swing from one to the next. We humans don't have that. <laughs> monkeys have that. It's vastly entertaining. They have prehensile tails. Well, prehensile comes from the same root as prehension, which is, serves as the root of prize. And so basically what prehensile or prehension means is to take, to take, to grab a hold of. Mm -hmm. So, surprise is to be taken from above. Sur is above. Hmm. Prize, or prehension, is taken. So, literally, to be surprised is to be taken from above. This next uh, image uh, will capture this maybe better in the human context. Surprise is to be taken from above. And the image I have of you in your Bible study, mm -hmm. or either one of us in our support groups, or as this individual is asking about in the best of our friendships, is that we're taken from above. And by above, I don't mean something in terms of outer space here. I mean taken, uh, taken by a sense of compassion. Mm -hmm. My experience in these moments of is experience of grace. And there's always a sense of being taken out of my circumstance by something that's above them. Mm -hmm. And so that's all I mean by being taken from above. So literally, this kind of love or compassion always surprises me. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's what we refer to as an aha experience here. And I, I'm calling it uh, in our presentation today an aha experience of grace. I've experienced this in self-help groups. I've experienced this working with 12-step sponsors. You've experienced it in your own version of self-help groups as mm -hmm. well as Bible studies. Yep. And there's a sense, there's a sense of I bring myself vulnerable and broken to the group. You do this as well. Mm -hmm. And in that, what we what we what we what we receive is love and care and compassion. And that aha experience, when it comes back together, leaves me with a new relationship to myself. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we can have one of these experiences that really leaves a lasting mark. My sense of it, it's more the repetition. The slide that I skipped by earlier simply said this, and I got this from Bonnie Badenoch. What fires together, wires together. And Bonnie's referring to brain science with that, is mm -hmm. that brain neurons that fire together when we learn something new, think of the train coupling. Right. Brain neurons, when they fire together, they begin to wire together. And so back yeah. to the train coupling metaphor, the more firing of that particular connection, that is intimacy equals grace, mm -hmm. intimacy equals compassion, intimacy equals safety, intimacy equals love, the more firings, the more wired that becomes to where that can actually become the fundamental wiring. Mm -hmm. If before it was intimacy equals danger, that can actually be healed or cured mm -hmm. by, by virtue of repetition right. in an oxygen rich environment to where Intimacy will heal the, the trauma. Intimacy will heal the wound. Mm. And the new wiring would suggest that intimacy equals safety and compassion. Okay. I have a quick question about that. Um, could that be the same for... Uh, well, let's see. Let me word this mm -hmm. correctly. Um, so typically, is it... Is it an emotion that uh, we get wired to, or like just in general, is it an emotion that we get wired to, or an action? Would you say? I don't know. If that makes sense. I think both. I think both. both. Uh, and and so, uh, can you give an example? For example, of an action. Let's include that too. Okay. I'm happy to open up the, the aperture here. Okay. Um, First thing that came to mind, uh, putting your hand on the stove. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> that's uh, right. That's the action. I right, <laughs> right, right. So what gets coupled with that? It's hot. Don't touch it. Right, right. And that becomes pretty sealed in. It's going to take yeah. a really cold stove for you to trust putting <laughs> your hand on that. So I think what you're what, what we're talking about is learning, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The way that we learn things. Bonnie would talk about this in terms of neurons connecting to one another. What fires together wires together. In your example of the stove, literally what fires together, which is fire, it fires with pain. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to avoid that. Okay. And so I think it's not a bad metaphor for what happens in relationship. If I get burned in a relationship, mm -hmm. or if you get burned in a relationship, it's not unlike what happens with the stove, and in some ways it can seal itself in as permanently as our aversion to putting our hands mm -hmm. on the stove, yeah. is that we'll avoid certain kind of interactions because I've been hurt here before. And you would say, well, once I've been hurt, why would I ever change that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's quite possible to live your whole life with early experiences never being challenged, mm -hmm. but if you're willing to risk in a new environment, now the stove is not hot. Mm -hmm. Now the stove is warm or cool, then why not open ourselves to that possibility mm -hmm. of having uh, having a new learning experience? Mm -hmm. um, I, so I, I definitely think it can tie into actions, and in some ways they're more powerful because they're so direct. I, was, I, I that thought that was you were my next question: What's more powerful, uh, emotion uh, or yeah, action? Yeah, yeah. That's really what I was trying to ask, really, yeah, is yeah. what's more powerful, yeah. the emotion or yeah. an action? Yeah. I, I, some of the material I'm reading right now that's looking at, at emotion mm -hmm. talks about it this way. There are very few experiences that we have that don't have an emotional tone to them, mm -hmm. either positive or negative. Mm -hmm. There are some that are neutral. There are some that are both, both positive and negative, but very few of them that are absent of any of that. Mm. We have preferences for and against. If you have a stove, there's a very strong preference and aversion to putting your finger on that. <laughs> it'd be hard to find experiences that are completely neutral if, we, if we're honest with ourselves. There are some that are, mm. but plenty of experiences, especially experiences that matter. We're talking about relationship. Yeah. Those experiences matter a lot for our yeah. survival. Mm -hmm. emotionally and physically, spiritually. And so they're oftentimes laced with emotional tone. So it'd be hard to find something that doesn't, including actions. And so your wife's mm -hmm. behavior towards you is, if, if it matters to you, is oftentimes going to be uh, inseparable from yeah. emotional tone mm -hmm. with that. I was going to say similarly around thought. I thought you were going to go a different direction a minute ago. I think the same thing can happen with thoughts where a new thought comes in mm -hmm. and you're open to it, and so it can reorganize whatever, you know, you can think about changes in your life, or there was some massive change, an aha experience that led you to a new insight mm -hmm. that once you had it, you could never put the jack back in the box again. I think the same thing can happen with thoughts. Thoughts mm -hmm. can come in, they can be transformative, and you come back together and you've been changed. Mm -hmm. If you think about religious conversion, for example, yeah. something opens up, and you come back and you're never the same person again. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. what we're talking about would apply to thoughts, would apply to feelings, would apply apply to behaviors or actions, it mm -hmm. seems like to me. So I think it's a useful metaphor, have yeah. Bonnie to think about that. Let me add one more piece from Bonnie to wrap up for today. We talked about how it is that we're, that we're working on moving from shaming ourselves. This is really this whole series we've been talking about this recently. And how it is that if shaming is the old organization, it opens up, Mm -hmm. And when it comes back together, I have the experience of being able to forgive myself and compassion towards myself. Here's an exercise for us, and we'll wrap up with this today in the last five minutes or so. Bonnie introduced this idea of consolidation. I actually worked up, looked up the word this week. Consolidation. Consolidation, because that's what I do <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and uh, uh, C-O-N, con, uh, connotes together in Latin. Mm. It means uh, to conjoin is to bring together. And solidari is exactly what it sounds like. It's to make solid. Mm. So literally consolidation is to make solid together. And I like that definition of consolidation because yeah. what Bonnie taught me, here's a picture of Bonnie again. There's a picture of Bonnie right there. There's mm -hmm. Bonnie. Uh, Bonnie taught me that that in order to get this material inside of ourselves, we have to make it solid. So I want to ask a question, and mm -hmm. let's both think about this for a second, and I want to invite you in the audience to think about this. And there's a question that comes in. I'll take a look at this in just a moment. Exercise is this. When were you taken from above? When have you experienced being surprised by grace, by compassion, by love? I want you to think of that and call, to, call it memory to mind right now. Okay, mm -hmm. give you just a moment to do that.
Here again is the physical image of being taken from above, a hand reaching down and taking you from above. I have an experience in my mind, a whole set of experiences, and you do too as well. Mm-hmm. What I'd like to suggest, well, before we do that, let me just ask, what came to your mind? I'll share what came to my mind. Okay. Uh, so a week before I was going to get married, uh, I met up with somebody that I met in a Bible study. Um, and it was another man that was interested in, in video production. So uh, he's an older man. And so I just wanted to meet up with lunch with him to get his uh, um, just intake on, because I was interested in partaking in a career in video production. Mm-hmm. So I just wanted to kind of pick at his brain. But uh, during our, our lunch and our conversation, um, you know, I was compelled to pretty much uh, share with him what was going on with me at the moment, which was I was in the middle of all this stuff of trying to figure out how to um, pretty much heal from what I had done and uh, recover from all that. And he shared with me as well that he's actually he's been five years without uh, porn addiction. Okay. So yeah. I was just like, wow, you know, yeah. here's yeah. first. Yeah. I was here for a video production, but now yeah. I know why we met is because yes. yeah. he went through this. So yeah. off of that, uh, uh, he pretty much became uh, a mentor yeah. on that aspect of it. But I was taking from above because yeah. he kind of yeah. reached out and said, hey, yeah. listen, this is what I went through. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you need help, here's my number. You are, you have my number, so reach out whenever you want. So it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's a per- perfect example of it. Let me ask all of us to do something based on what you shared. I have an example, and I won't go into detail right now, but a very dear man in my life, my high school German teacher, so many times across my life he touched touched me. He passed away 20 years ago, and he's so much with me still. Yeah. And so he's still. He's still taking me from above with with (laughs) grace, it seems like to me. Let me ask for you and I to do this and for our audience that's viewing today, and I'll tie it into the comment that came in here online, is that your homework for this next week is to take this image, take this memory, and to rehearse it once a day, just Mm -hmm. each day, maybe at the start of the day, maybe at the end of the day. Rehearse that experience that you had with this individual that I had with, with Mr. Hayes. And, uh, and if you care to, to write down what happened and allow yourself to fill it in as the week goes by, each day that you remember it, fill it in with a few more details. Like I remembered a specific instance with Mr. Hayes that was very formative for me. But what about if I add another memory, another nuance to that? So by the end of the week, I've done something, is that I've rehearsed it again and again and again. Mm-hmm. And I've actually allowed it to grow and kind of take root. We're really talking about this, allowing this... Yeah. to become more solid. That's really the idea that Bonnie was talking about. To consolidate the memory requires rehearsal mm. and that we can benefit from firing it together, firing it again and again and again until it eventually wires together. Someone wrote in here about a, a, a biblical uh, story about someone being baptized seven times. We're talking about baptizing ourselves seven times this week. Mm-hmm. Can we do that? <laughs> uh, I want to invite you to consider doing that this week. The, the, the goal here is to allow ourselves to continue to be surprised, not just once, but to be able to revisit that. It's a way of giving mm-hmm. a gift to ourselves. Mm-hmm. You revisit this. I, I like can that. feel as you're sharing the story. It's like it's, yeah. it's in the room right now. Yeah. And why not treat ourselves to that on a daily basis? I think there's great value in bringing this into your daily remembrances. I think of it in terms of daily gratitudes, mm-hmm. gratitudes for individuals that have touched our lives, just like yeah. your friend did with you mm-hmm. and like my friend did with me. So today's topic has been surprise, shame with love. To be taken from above, from shame, and to have shame opened up and have our hearts filled with compassion or love and have it reconsolidate in such a way that that begins to be the new memory that we're creating. Mm -hmm. We've done our best to explain very technical (laughs) brain science today. I really want to thank Bonnie. Bonnie's one of the dear souls in my life for for extending grace over over all these years together. Very grateful to her. In the same spirit as today, we've been talking about how it is that shame is interpersonal. We'll be looking next week, we'll be revisiting next week how it is that we can address shame 
and other emotional uh, uh, distresses in our lives, how we, can, how we can address those not only interpersonally by reaching out to group members or friends, ministers, counselors, mm -hmm. but also what we can do within ourselves. And so we'll be revisiting in the context of what we've shared today, we'll be re revisiting how to address shame in our lives, but how to do that uh, in our own interior practice. And so we'll be coming back to forgiveness practice next week. Thank you for sending in your questions uh, today. I appreciate very much your interaction with us. I invite you to continue to send in questions. Here's my website. If you have any final questions you want to send to me this week, you can send it to me at drbobweathers.com. You can also send it to Beginnings or Facebook, uh, Ask Addiction Specialist, or YouTube, Ask Addiction Specialist. Come back and join us next week. Thank you for being with us today. Come back and join us for uh, uh, an advanced take on forgiveness practice. Really appreciate you being with us. Thank you, Odie. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Austin. Thank you, Franz. Bless you guys. Okay, have a good week, and we'll see you next week. Take care.